Within an object oriented program, there is a clear relationship between a class and an object. Now, one of the things I like to do is to look at a class and to realize, in fact, it is a template that defines an object. If you like, it is a blueprint from which objects are actually created. And I also consider something referred to as the execution space. And this is the environment in which an object actually exists. And from the class, we can see an object is actually created. And it exists in the execution space in its own right. Every object in the execution space is named. In other words, every object has its own identifier, as you can see here. So within the execution space, there could be a number of objects, and they all have their own unique identifier. Now, once the object is in the execution space, I think it's fair that we can remove the relationship as represented by the arrow from the diagram, because what we really now have is a concentration on what the object will do for us, because the class was just there to help produce the object. We have an instance of the class. Now, as a programmer, we need to know what the class does in terms of what it is as a template because it tells us things about the object. It'll tell us what behavior the object has, for example. It'll tell us what attributes the object actually has. So let's go on and have a look at what we mean by object behaviors, object attributes, and realize that, in fact, they are derived from the class. So if we go forward with our diagram, what we can see here, I now have a class again, but you can see that the class has a name, it has attributes, and it has behaviors. And as a programmer, we can use the classes of others. By that, I mean other people have produced classes, and we can simply use them, or we can create our own classes. Now, just as an aside to get a feel for what a class is, you can see here that a typical name for a class could be vehicle. In other words, a car, a lorry, something like that. And an attribute, for example, of a car could be the colour of the car. Now, a behaviour of a car is quite clearly something that it can do, some kind of action. And, of course, you can drive a car. Now, what we have here is a rough idea of what we mean by attributes and behaviors and of course what we do when we want an instance of a particular class we think of the execution space and the fact that from the class an object is created as you can see here now diagrammatically i like to show attributes in the center of a circular shape as you can see here surrounding those attributes i have behaviors and this particular approach, I think, is a useful one. You'll see later in the playlist, when I get onto it, we'll talk about UML diagrams, which don't use circles like this. But I like to have a mental picture of a class being this rectangular shape and an object being a circular shape that has at its core attributes and surrounding that core, it has particular behaviors. Of course, like all objects, what we're really saying is we have an instance of the class. And of course, like all objects in the execution space, they're given an appropriate name, an appropriate identifier, as you can see here. So what we have here is an object, and that object is based on the class. So whatever the attributes are that are defined in the class, those attributes appear in the object. Whatever behaviors are defined in the class, those behaviors appear in the actual object. And when they're in the object, they're called instance attributes and instance behaviors. Another word for behaviors in an object is methods. And we'll talk about other words for attributes in a later video. Let's now consider the relationship as shown here between the class and the object and you can see there's an arrow joining them now i'm going to remove that arrow because i want to emphasize again that what we now have in the execution space is an object and we now use the object in our program that's why we call it object oriented programming the class was there to help produce the object 
Once the class has produced the object, we now as programmers wonder what the object's going to do for us. And as I've already mentioned, we need to understand what the class is because it will be defining all of the attributes and it will be defining all of the behaviors. But as a programmer, I now need to concentrate on this particular object. Although as the programmer, I am particularly interested in the object because that's the thing that's inside my program. That's the thing that's going to be doing things for me as the computer programmer. But I also frequently have to reflect back on the class because it's the class that defines the attributes and defines the behaviors. And when we talk about attributes and behaviors, we give them the generic name of members. And of course, these members exist in the object, but they exist in the object as instant members. So in other words, when we talk about the object, we have an instance behavior and we have attributes which we refer to as instance attributes, as opposed to the members that are defined in the actual class. So it enables us to distinguish between whether we're talking about the class or whether we're talking about the actual object. But if the class has five attributes, the object has five attributes. If the class has six behaviors, the object has six behaviors. But of course, the object will have six instance behaviors, and the object in this particular case will have five instance attributes. Having shown the relationship between a class and an object, what I'd like to do now is to concentrate on the execution space, i.e. where all the objects will be when the program is actually executing. So if we look in abstract now at a typical object oriented program, what we will find happening is we'll have objects being created and these objects will create other objects. And here you can see I've got two objects, both with different identifiers. This one has got the identifier identifier underscore A, this one is identifier underscore B to show in fact that there is a difference. And what can happen when we have these objects in existence, or what will happen, is they'll send messages to each other, which I'm showing with this particular arrow here. So what's happening is this object is sending a message to this one to ask it to do something for it. Now, the case may be that this particular object says, well, I can't do all of that for you. What I'm going to do, however, I know another object that's capable of helping me out to perform the tasks that you want so it creates another object and sends a message to it and this object now might be able to do part of what the original object wanted so for example let's say this object asks this object to calculate its net pay it says well i can calculate your gross pay but I can calculate the deductions. I'll ask this one to calculate the deductions. So it does. Of course, when this one calculates the deductions, this one can use the information that this will pass back to this and subtract it from the gross pay that this worked out and then pass back to this object the net pay and the gross pay if this particular object wanted both. So we can see we have these objects performing tasks through messaging. And the messages actually stop and this object is no longer needed. Consequently, we might now have a different situation where this sends a message and this says, well, I can do that for you, but I need another object to help. It gets the other object coming into existence, sends it a message, and then you have a situation whereby you have objects in the execution space messaging each other to perform particular tasks. So we can see that an object oriented program is a community of communicating objects. This communication is achieved using messages. The messages invoke behaviors in the objects receiving the message. So in other words, if you have an object and it wants another object to do something, it sends it a message. And that object that receives the message says, I've got a behavior that will do that for you. Now, it must have a behavior to do that for you. Otherwise, you wouldn't bother sending it the message, would you? You wouldn't create an object to find gross pay if you knew it couldn't find the gross pay. So you as the programmer need to have an understanding of all of the classes and what 
member behaviors they have so you can create an instance of them a object of them that you can send a message to in the knowledge that it is capable of finding the gross pay for you so what we have in an object orientated program is an object like this which will create another object and it will send it a message and the relationship between these objects is as follows this is the sending object and this one here is the receiving object now when this message is sent from this object to this one one of two main things can happen this object's attribute could be changed in some way because this could be a form for example that you are asking to change the color of so this object is saying to this one change your color please so it changes its color what can also happen this object can send a message to this one and actually say to it give me something back please and so this will return some value to this particular object here such as gross pay such as net pay or whatever it may be but this relationship that you have here you have a sending object and a receiving object in the knowledge that really two kinds of things can happen you can send a message to change the attributes of this particular object or you can ask this object to do something for you and send something back let's now just concentrate on the receiving object here we can see an object that has attributes and behaviors and it's got this particular identifier here and what we want to do we want to send from some other object a message to it so I'm just going to show that message coming in here now what we need to realize we need some kind of syntax to allow us to do this kind of thing and of course if I'm sending a message to this object and there's lots of these objects in the execution space how do I know which object to send my message to well each object has their own name and you can see this one has got the name identifier here consequently to send the message to this particular object I use this name and you can see that here you see here is my name that's the object to which I'm sending this message and of course the message I'm sending I'm giving the name message here but if you notice in between there's a full stop this is referred to as dot notation which means on this side as you're looking at on the left hand side is the name of the object that you're going to be sending this message to and you can see this message is on the right hand side of this particular dot now this particular video has looked at the relationship between a class and an object in abstract the next video is going to look at it with a particular type of class and instance of that class and it's going to do so with the string class and we're going to be creating an instance of the string class i.e. an object of the string class and we're going to reflect on what we've looked at here with respect to an actual programming example check out the supporting website for these videos and also consider subscribing to the youtube channel and get an automatic update every time i upload a new video also consider subscribing to the google plus circle that relates to these videos